There was an incident in Pasadena, California. I don't drink much coffee. I don't have a relationship with caffeine. But every now and then, I'll be delighted to have a nice cup of hot cocoa. And I went to one of these coffee houses, you know, with the chalkboard out front. I'm in there, I order hot chocolate. And I order it with whipped cream, of course. And it comes to the table, and there's no whipped cream. And I said, I ordered this with whipped cream. And they said, oh, we put it on. And I said, well, where is it? Oh, he said, it sunk to the bottom. I then said, either the laws of physics that apply everywhere in the universe are suspended in your coffee shop, or you didn't put whipped cream on my hot cocoa. Now, to his credit, rather than continue to argue with me, he intended to prove me wrong. Oh. So he went into the kitchen, brought out the whipped cream, scooped it up, popped it in my, in my hot cocoa, and it bobbed once and floated atop. And there it was. A point has no dimensions, a line has one dimension, length. A square has two dimensions, so the height and width. A cube has three dimensions, height, width, depth. A line is one dimensional, but it's bounded by two zero dimensional things. Those are the points. A square is two dimensions, bounded by four one dimensional sides. A cube is three dimensions, bounded by six two dimensional sides. A four-dimensional cube has eight sides, and each of those sides is a three-dimensional cube, one dimension down from itself. In the same way, each side of a three-dimensional cube is a two-dimensional square. So when you get to four dimensions, the sides are three-dimensional surfaces. William Herschel comes around and says, I wonder if the different colors of light have different temperatures. So he laid down the spectrum with sunlight prism, and he put a thermometer in each color. And then he had an eighth thermometer, I don't know if he used one and did the experiment eight, seven times, but he had another thermometer that he used as the control thermometer. You put that over to the side mm -hmm. where there are no colors, and that would presumably just measure the room temperature. So he knows enough to even think that this is an interesting exercise, and he's got a control thermometer, and he just puts it over to the side of the red, out of sight, and then he watches the, the thermometers. And the control thermometer goes through the roof, and, and he's looking at it, and he says, something must be coming through the prism that I cannot see. And he describes this as light unfit for vision. He discovers infrared light. You have never met someone at a place unless it was also at a time. And you have never met someone at a time unless it was also at a place. We know intuitively that we need four dimensions to localize someone to meet up with them. Only two dimensions if you don't have tall buildings. You have tall buildings, you need the third dimension. So you don't say, I'll meet you at the 20th floor of 721 Park Avenue. What time? There's a full four dimensions going on there. So just I want to convince you we live in a four dimensional world. Isaac Newton is the first to understand that white light is composed of colors. He takes white light, puts it through a prism, and he gets Roy G. Biv. Actually, he had a mystical fascination with the number seven, mm -hmm. so he wanted to lay down seven colors. But indigo is just really blue-violet. But anyhow, we'll give him his indigo because he did all that stuff before he turned 26. So <laughs> if you invent calculus just on a dare, we give it to you, all right? We'll give you indigo if you need to have indigo. So he's got the colors, and then he took those colors, merged them back together, and he got white light out the other side. That's some freaky stuff, that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet equals white. I'm a fan of the edict, if an argument lasts more than five minutes, then both sides are wrong. I think that applies maybe 85% of the time, but yes. it's a good tenet to, yes. to carry with you. Now watch, this is how science works. One researcher comes up with a result, and that is not the truth. A scientific emergent truth is not the result of any one experiment. What has to happen is somebody else has to verify it, preferably a competitor, preferably someone who doesn't want you to be correct, such as my waiter. He went out to prove me wrong and got the same result that I had declared. We can call that the beginnings of an emergent truth about whipped cream. Now we need someone to do it in Asia and in Europe. And then you get a trend and you can then declare that a consensus of observation and experiments has emerged in the scientific community. Whipped cream floats on hot chocolate. Of course whipped cream has to float because first of all, before it was whipped cream, it was cream, okay? And old timers remember, what does cream do in unhomogenized milk? It floats to the top, and you skim off the cream, leaving behind skim milk, okay? This is how that works. Now, you take the heavy cream, 
<laughs> and then whip it, putting air into it. It is not going to sink on any known liquid devised by man, okay? <laughs> there was a time when people believed that the heavens up there were the province of God, and whatever was going on in there was unknowable, and it would be basically sinful to find out. Newton comes along, and then everything changes. Newton comes along, writes down equations of motion, equations of gravity, and kind of on a dare, he and Vents integral and differential calculus. Then he turned 26. So he writes down these equations and he can now demonstrate how, why, and where, and what the planets are doing. And so potent was his new theory of gravity that it worked for moons of Jupiter orbiting Jupiter, not just planets orbiting the sun. And this was the first indication, maybe this is not just a local truth, that maybe it applies across the universe. And this was a little bit of heresy. In fact, Newton was accused by some say, Isaac, you've left nothing for God to do. We are in, an intelligent species because we defined ourselves that way. We don't have the benefit of another species to compare ourselves with against whom we might fail miserably. And so when we compare ourselves to chimps, we sit up righteously and say, we have poetry and a Hubble telescope and philosophy, yet there's only 1% difference in our DNA. But then you'll say, what a difference that 1% makes. And I would say maybe that 1% DNA difference corresponds with an equally small difference in the intelligence between a chimp and humans. Imagine some other species that visits us that's 1% along on that same scale, smarter than us. Consider, the smartest chimp does what our toddlers can do. The simplest human thoughts are inconceivable to a chimp and their talents are about what our toddlers can do. So let's get back to this 1% smarter alien that we've discovered. Corresponding this analogy, we now say, what would we look like to them? There's certain things you just can't do because they're prevented by all known laws of physics. You cannot spontaneously set yourself into motion unless you push off of something else or you lose some kind of mass that was within you. So rockets, when they take off, they're ejecting mass out the other side. So all the people are levitating, it's some kind of an illusion that they're not telling you about, period. But if you really want to levitate, if this is really important to you. I tried to calculate how many cans of beans this would require. Then you gotta kinda hold it in, then let loose. Suddenly. Suddenly. Yes. And in principle, for the duration of the thrust, you can levitate briefly. But this would argue against the lotus position because there would be an opening so suddenly that there'd be too much, too soon, too fast, and therefore no rise. Well, you could stay there if it just kept yes. coming in. Right, so it's not impossible to hold a lotus position. It's just unlikely you're doing it for these other ways that are described. You've seen that thing on, on Jupiter, that storm that never quits, the big red thing, the big... Yeah, we call it the red spot on Jupiter. We call it Jupiter's red spot. Okay. Yeah. Because that's how we roll. <laughs> that thing is... Spots on the sun, sunspots. See? Any geologist or chemist in the audience? You should be jealous of this fact. Because you guys name stuff that nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. I was channel surfing one day, waiting for a movie to come on at the top of the hour. I hit a football game, and they just ended the game at a tie, and they just started overtime. After the necessary exchange of possession, it became sudden death overtime. And then one of the teams, Cincinnati Bengals, got within 50 yards, and they kicked a field goal. And the ball rotated up. It hit the left upright of the goalpost and went in. And I said, which stadium is this? What's the latitude? And I looked at the orientation of the stadium, I did a calculation, and then I tweeted. The overtime winning field goal by the Cincinnati Bengals was likely aided by a one-third of an inch deflection to the right imparted by Earth's rotation. 